What is up guys, Kari Medic here and welcome back to another dose. I'm finally doing my doctor specialty review that I'm probably the most excited about, the one that I've been waiting to make for quite some time and that's orthopedic surgery. I've always known that I've wanted to be a surgeon and that I wanted to pursue surgical training and you've probably seen that throughout my videos over the last few years, but I never quite knew which surgical specialty I wanted to do. And in my F1 year, I rotated through vascular surgery and renal transplant surgery. And then in my F2, I got the opportunity to do orthopedic surgery. For my elective as a medical student, I rotated through pediatric surgery and then generally throughout my time in medical school I've had some experience in general surgery, urology and I think that's pretty much it. I haven't had the chance to do any neurosurgery and I also haven't had the chance to do any ENT. And I always knew that I didn't want to do a scope or laparoscopic based surgical specialty so those will be things like urology, largely now general surgery and ENT. I always knew that I wanted a scalpel in my hand, I wanted to do something open, I wanted to be able to dissect you know the different layers that go into human cavities that sounds kind of weird, but within a surgical <laughs> within a surgical context, I promise it's okay. And so after this rotation in orthopedic surgery, seeing all the hammering, drilling, screwing, all the nails, operating on all the different parts of the body, we've got the shoulders, the elbows, the wrists, the hips, the knees, the ankles, you know, I completely fell in love and orthopedic surgery is the one for me. So I'm very excited to take you guys into a deep dive about what this placement looked like for me, what it involved, what we did, etc. So grab some coffee, grab some snacks, sit back, relax, and let's chat. Okay, so why did I do an orthopedic surgery placement? If you guys have been following this channel for a while, then you know that orthopedic surgery was not one of the rotations that I was meant to be doing in my F2 year. I was actually supposed to be doing palliative medicine. But what happened before I moved to my palliative medicine placement is that I got an email saying that the hospice, the building where the palliative medicine rotation was organized, was being shut down due to some bad concrete or something like that in the building that they needed to look at. And so in the meantime, they wanted to move me to a medical specialty in the hospital. And I emailed back and also CC'd in like the training program director, the sort of highest person that I could for my training as a doctor in my F2 year. And I said, listen, please, please, please don't put me onto a medical specialty. I want to do surgery. I want to be a surgeon and I would love to do any surgical specialty. But if I get the choice, please put me in orthopedic surgery. And seemingly by some sheer luck and some amazing you know, turn of events, I was actually allowed to do orthopedic surgery instead of palliative medicine, which was like the best thing to ever happen to me in my F2 year as a doctor. And not only that, when I got moved onto the placement, they didn't want to put me on the on-call rota because if that building got sorted out, they wanted to move me back to palliative medicine. And so they said, put him on a nine to five schedule, no on-calls, no nights, so that if he has to go back to his original job, he can move easily without messing up the orthopedic surgery rota. So not only was I doing orthopedic surgery, the specialty that I was the most interested in and most excited about, but I had no on-calls and I had no nights. Pretty much a dream job from my F2. So a few weeks before I started my rotation, I I went to one of the outpatient orthopedic clinics. I knocked on the door and I introduced myself to one of the orthopedic registrars and just said, hey, I'm going to be starting orthopedic surgery in a couple of weeks. I'd absolutely love to spend some time with you in theater, come and see what the surgeries are like and get involved. And, you know, the guy was amazing, amazing, amazing. If you're watching this video, you know who you are. And he really took me under his wing and said, yeah, of course, please come to theater. I'm going to be operating on days X, Y, and Z. And so I spent a few weeks with him in theater outside of work. So in the evenings and on the weekends, on my annual leave, etc. And I got to really know both him and the orthopedic team more more widely and so i already had a little bit of a sort of in and knowledge and experience in orthopedic surgery before i started my rotation and then a few weeks later my orthopedic surgery rotation began so the team consisted of three f1s one other f2 myself an f2 and then an f3 and two core trainees, so CT1 and CT2 level, and then I think five or six registrars and maybe seven or eight consultants, something like that. So it was quite a big team, but obviously not everyone was working at the same time every day. And on the wards, it was generally two or well, one to three F1s, and then at least one F2, and then an F3 or a CT1. So the team of three F1s, the other F2 and the other F3 were all girls, and we honestly had the best, best time like not only did we do our job and you know get everything done but we had so much fun whilst we did it we were constantly laughing you know joking around sharing stories about what we were doing in our time outside of medicine and just had really really good vibes together we all got along very well we were very eager to help each other with our workload we were very good at making sure we all took our breaks everyone got to go to lunch helping people finish on time so they could leave work at the right time and not stay late. It was just a really, really great environment of teamwork. And this made an absolutely huge, huge difference. Surgical specialties generally for F1s and F2s can be very difficult jobs and they are very difficult jobs. 
you've often got quite a high patient load and also the patients can become very unwell and you generally don't have very much support from your seniors, your core trainees and your registrars and your consultants because they're always operating in theater they're, or in clinic. They're not really, well, they don't really look after the wards at all. And so surgical wards, generally speaking, are largely run by and looked after by the F1s and F2s and sometimes like a F3, someone doing a JCF or something like that. And every now and again, maybe the core trainees will pay a visit to the ward, but it's very, very rare. And then even in the orthopedic department, you know, the doctors, we were all really good friends with the physiotherapists, the occupational therapists, the nurses in charge, the nurses, just everyone was just such a good vibe. I don't know how to describe it. Like when you're a doctor and you rotate through all these different specialties, so I've done six different specialties in my F1 and F2 year. Every time you move jobs, you meet a completely new set of people, new doctors, new other healthcare staff that surround that role. And so, you know, you meet tons of people and to find and have a job where we got along with everyone on the ward was just really, really special. And when you're close to the other doctors on your job, more than just colleagues, you like you become friends. It just, it makes such a, such a big difference. And you know, if any of them are watching this video, huge shout out to you guys. I miss you all the time. And I miss, I miss all our, all our days spent on orthopedic surgery. Anyway, a quick word about the registrars and the consultants. So these are our seniors who spend the vast majority of their time in clinic and in theater, and then come up to the wards to round on their patients with our help every now and again, not every day, sometimes not every few days, etc. depending on the registrar. But honestly, absolutely fantastic. So this was some of the best group of seniors who I think were very keen on and wanted to actually teach the juniors. And all the registrars maybe bar one of them so six out of the seven you actually felt like they were trying to take you under their wing and they were trying to show you and teach you and get you involved and make you do things you know in orthopedics you have a lot of very practical procedures so there's a lot of pulling or reducing of dislocated joints or fractures in joints and they were always encouraging us to do them and to watch and to learn and to do them so we could gain those skills and do those skills and then when we were in theater they were always very focused on making sure that we got to actually be involved in the surgery to actually do important steps and learn and gain, you know, surgical skills and learn how to do these procedures and things. They were very, very, very keen to help, which I'm forever grateful for. So in theater, for example, you know, let's say we're replacing plates with some screws over a fractured radius in the wrist. You know, they would place the plate, they would put in a screw and then they'd be like, okay, this is how you put, put in a screw. Here's the screw, here's the screwdriver, <laughs> take them and, you know, put in the nail. They would watch us do it, correct our angle, explain to us about the force, how much to put tension on it, etc. Or, you know, when closing up the wound, they would let us suture and they would watch us suture and give us advice on our technique and say, you know, redo this one or put these closer, tighten more here, etc., etc. whatever it is. But the point is they were putting in effort in letting us learn and teaching us, which is really, really important. Something you don't get a lot of sometimes in foundation training, depending on where you are. So very, very grateful for that, honestly. It's worth saying again, some of the best senior doctors I've ever had. Thank you. As far as the consultants go, I honestly found them all very approachable, very easygoing. We had all of their numbers on WhatsApp and we could message them at pretty much any time. And they were very responsive, always like helping sort out the bigger picture, larger issues that we might have had that needed consultant involvement. And they would always joke around and we'd have a good time in the morning trauma meetings. They would also want to teach and be quite keen on teaching and asking us questions. So honestly, the orthopedic team, 10 out of 10. Love to you guys. Ortho Jerry's versus non ortho Jerry's. Okay, so what did I do every day <laughs> as a F2 doctor in orthopedic surgery? Every single day started out with a morning trauma meeting, and this started at eight o'clock in the morning, I think, eight or eight thirty. No, eight, eight o'clock in the morning. And this would run for approximately half an hour to 45 minutes running through all the patients of the day. So these are patients that are going to get operated on today, patients that got admitted from A&E overnight, and patients that are on a waiting list for surgeries to happen, and then also patients that uh, needed discussion in a trauma meeting to help make a plan for them. So this trauma list that we would go through every day was an Excel sheet that would get updated on a daily basis in the shared drive of the hospital. And it was basically, for lack of a better word, in my humble opinion, it was a bit of a mess. So, you know, there was like the section at the top of patients who needed surgery in their priority order, and then patients for a discussion, patients on the waiting list, patient, and then like urgent, and then jobs that needed to get done. Some were urgent, some were not so urgent, some needed to be done today, some could be done tomorrow. It was a little bit of a mess in my humble opinion. So I think two months into the rotation, I took that Excel sheet, 
and I redesigned it and reorganized it. I color coded the whole thing and I made a traffic light system of urgency. So red was super, super urgent, needs to be done today. Orange was like pretty urgent, needs to be done within the next one to three days. And then green was something that you could work on throughout the week, it didn't need to happen right now. And I wrote like a little paragraph saying, you know, hello, this is the new traffic light system for, th for this trauma list. This is how it's gonna work. This is what it looks like. And I just saved it. And then the next day in the morning, we were in the trauma meeting and one of the registrars was like running through it and all the consultants were sitting there. And one of them's like, who did this? Like who changed the trauma meeting list or whatever. And I remember sitting there in the corner, like feeling like anxious and nervous and scared. And I was like, me. <laughs> and I think my voice cracked when I said it as per usual. And everyone started laughing. So they're like, ah, he's so scared, blah, blah, blah. But anyways, the long story short is that the, the consultant loved it. They thought it was a great idea and it, it all went well. And then after that morning meeting, we would basically split off with the juniors going to the wards and then the registrars and the consultants going down to theater or to clinic, wherever they needed to be. And so on the wards, it was largely split in two. So we had the orthogeriatric patients and the not orthogeriatric patients. So orthogeriatric patients are patients in our, it depends on the hospital you're in, but in our hospital, it was patients above the age of 65 so that were admitted under orthopedics. And then non orthogerous patients were patients under the age of 65 who were admitted under orthopedics. And the reason we have this distinction is that this class or this group of patients have an unusually high mortality rate in the hospital. They're elderly, usually with major injury to the bone. So large fractures of the hip, of the knee, of the shoulder, whatever. And so they're physiologically quite severely impacted and they're more prone to becoming really unwell or not surviving their length of stay hospital. And this is especially true for neck of femur fracture patients. So we call these NOFs, N-O-F, neck of femur fracture patients. These patients have a particularly high mortality rate as a group of patients in the hospital. So the orthogeriatric team would see the orthogeriatric patients with a consultant ward round on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then on Tuesday and Thursday, there was no consultant. The juniors would ward round those patients. So the orthogeriatric patients would be seen by the F1s with a consultant on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then, then on Tuesday and Thursday, it would just be the F1 seeing them. And then the non-orthogeriatric patients would be seen by myself as one of the F2s or one of the other F2s or F3s. Um, and we would see and deal with those patients. So for the F1s on the rotation, this was helpful because there would be a consultant plan for these patients coming to see them on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So they could basically just follow that plan. And, you know, you obviously deal with any patients that become unwell in the meantime, etc. But their plan was pretty much sorted for them. Then for the non-orthogeriatric patients, they were basically just seen by me or the other F2s or F3s on the board, which was great because this leads to a lot of independence critical thinking, clinical decision-making, et cetera. And I've talked about this before in my other review videos like this. The parts of this job that I enjoy the most are when I actually get to be a doctor. You know, following around a consultant with a computer, typing up the notes, following their plan, et cetera, is not what I want to do. <laughs> it is very much something that, you know, I was happy doing when I was an F1 and maybe early on in my F2, but after being on acute medicine, and having a lot more kind of responsibility and ownership over clinical decisions for patients. I've really, really enjoyed that. And I've taken that with me throughout orthopedic surgery and then even further in emergency medicine, which is my next rotation that I'll talk about in another video. But basically, you know, starting to get this autonomy and responsibility and decision-making for the patients is, you know, ultimately what being a doctor is about. And that's what I liked about this orthopedic job so much is that I got a lot of freedom and independence reviewing patients on my own making decisions for them. And of course, if I was unsure of anything, or if I needed further advice, seniors were always available and around and I could always reach out to them. And I did many, many, many times. But just the fact that you see the patients by yourself, you make the plans for them, you do the jobs for them, you follow up on what you've done, you see if there's good outcomes, if there's not so good outcomes, you adjust for the next time. This is what being a doctor is all about. I absolutely love this on orthopedic surgery. Okay, next section, firms. So how orthopedic surgery was broken down was as follows. So you had within the big group of consultants and registrars, you had a team for foot and ankle, a team for hip and knee, a team for spinal surgery or two teams for spinal surgery. And then there was another one, upper limb. Yeah, so shoulder and elbow basically. Yeah, that was it. So you had designated consultants and registrars for each of these different subspecialties, okay? And so, for example, if I came across a septic knee patient that had had their third washout yesterday and was now bleeding everywhere on the bed, and I needed to contact somebody about this, I would need to contact the hip and knee registrar 
preferably the one who did the surgery, but if they're not there, the hip and knee registrar who could then liaise with the hip and knee consultant. And so the F1s were attached to a set of consultants who were attached to a set of registrars. And so on days when the spinal team came and they wanted to see their spinal patients, they would call that F1 and they would take that F1 with them, see all the patients and the F1 would document and do the jobs, etc., etc. So we kind of had these like smaller groups within the big orthopedic surgery specialty. And this was quite useful because when you had a problem with a specific patient, you could contact the specific person about that problem. Now, if the registrar for that particular subspecialty wasn't there, then you could talk to someone who's cross covering that specialty and we had this like little paper on the wall that said who's cross covering who and when and blah 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 and if they weren't there then you could call the on-call registrar but that was typically super 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 busy and generally not very available to help with these things although they they would but they're kind of the last port of call because they're so busy and have their own bunch of stuff to deal with okay surgery time so i tried to go to theater as much as humanly possible i would go during the day if the workload allowed for it i'd go in the evenings i'd stay late i even came in on the weekends on on my annual leave to come in and do extra theater time this group of senior doctors were just so good that i was like i want to spend as much time as possible with them in theater because they're they're teaching me so much they're helping me learn so much and they're letting me do so much it was just such 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 a valuable surgical placement experience now the underlying problem was that there was just so much work to do up on the wards that it was very difficult for us to get enough free time to go down to theater during the day during working hours. So we had, like I said, three F1s, me as an F2, another F2, an F3, and then two core trainees and a whole bunch of registrars. So the core trainees and the registrars, it is their job and it is their requirement to get trained in surgery and to become surgeons. So their priority is surgical training and they spend as much time as possible in theater and they have priority to be in theater all the time, basically. So they would never come up to help on the ward so that we could go down to theater because that's just not how it worked. They had priority and they were always in theater. If there was extra availability or they weren't around or if one of the registrars needed an extra person, then we could go to theater, if that makes sense. Now, the annoying part about this is that what this meant was that registrars were often inviting me to come to theater. I'd see them in the morning or I'd see them walking around the hospital and they'd be like, oh, I'm doing this case in the afternoon. You should come and like be my assistant. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds absolutely amazing. I definitely want to be there. Except, you know, I have 10 patients upstairs that have a bunch of jobs that need need doing. And I have two F1s who also have their own patients and are going to need my help. And we, you know, we all need to support each other to finish that workload so that we can go home on time. If I come down to theater and operate for two to three hours, then all that stuff upstairs is going to get delayed. And this really, 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 really bothered me because we just needed to be better staffed so that the wards could be taken care of so that there was time for someone to go to theater every damn day so that we could also get trained in surgical skills and get operating time and theater time and blah, blah, blah. But we were often way too busy up on the wards to send one of the juniors down to go operate in theater. So this really annoyed me, as you can probably tell. And what I ended up doing is I made a surgery rota. So I looked at the rota for all the juniors for the next few months and I identified days when we would be well staffed enough on the ward that one of us could go to theater in the morning or in the afternoon. So let's say we had, I would need something like a minimum of four people on the wards. If we happened to be five people working that day, one person could go down to theater and spend the day operating. So I made this rota and I allocated each one of us days where we would go to theater. And you know, in the morning, I would just say to the team, I'm like, you know, you're not coming to the wards, you're going to theater, you have your theater day today. And then, you know, in a few days time, that would be me and I'd leave everyone on the wards and I'd go to the theater. And this way, we actually managed to go to theater and we actually managed to spend time operating either for a full day or just in the morning or just in the afternoon, depending on how busy things were upstairs. But with this rota that I made, we identified days where we would be well staffed and we can, from the beginning, say, you're going to theater. And the registrars and the consultants, they loved this. They were super supportive of the idea. They're like, that's great. We want you guys to be in theater. We don't want you to be taking care of the wards all day. So, you know, if you can figure out a way to take care of the wards and also send someone to theater, that's excellent. And in fact, they loved this so much that in the following rotation, when I was on emergency medicine and the next set of juniors came into orthopedic surgery, they implemented this formally. And so from the very beginning, there was a surgery rota and an on-call rota where a junior was attached to theater or attached to the on-call registrar for the whole day, which is amazing. That's, for, that's literally what I wanted to do. And that's what I did, but only for about a month and a half towards the end of the rotation. But it's great. I'm very happy that they implemented that. It's exactly what the juniors need on that job to get into theater time. And so yeah, props to all the senior team for, for making that happen. Now let's talk about the actual surgery. 
and being in theater because you know th this was some of the best 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 experience i've ever had in my life so like i've talked about before the environment in theater was extremely welcoming it was extremely like it was fostering a good healthy teaching environment it wasn't stressful it wasn't you know you're doing this wrong why did you do this it was just mm, very what's the word here it was supportive supportive and friendly of the junior doctors that came to, to teach them and to get them to learn and actually do stuff in theater and i'll never forget the first time that i drilled into someone's radius so that's the external or lateral bone in the forearm and we were putting a plate someone had a broken wrist and uh, my senior he places the plate you know takes the drill and drills a hole into the radius and he's like talking me through all the steps whilst we're doing it and after he does it he turns to me and he's like all right walk me through what we just did and I explained the whole thing to him and he's like, okay, it's your turn. And he just hands me the drill and I'm like, it's go time. So run through the whole thing again. And then under his guidance and his supervision, drill my first ever hole through a radius, which was absolutely amazing. Like I literally, I, I still can't forget it. And then place the screw in it afterwards. And it was just such a good feeling. It was like, this is how you do it. Run me through the process to show me that you know what you're doing. And then under the supervision and guidance of the senior, you perform the thing, proving that you can do it. And then next time you can do it. This is what this is what training is all about. This is what we want as juniors in surgical specialties, as aspiring surgeons. I mean, it was just, it was amazing. And so, yeah, during my time in theater, I saw so many things. I mean, let's just start head to toe. So, you know, a lot of shoulder arthroscopy, repairing the rotator cuff muscles and different uh, ligaments and tendons to help provide shoulder stability. I didn't see any shoulder fractures, I don't think. A lot of elbow fractures, so particularly olecranon fractures, that was quite common. Dislocations of the ulnar radius of the elbow, and then loads of wrists, plenty of people falling on outstretched hands and uh, breaking their wrists. I saw one finger surgery, I think, that was it. And then hips, plenty of hips. So, you know, arthroplasties, hemiarthroplasties. So these are full hip replacements or half hip replacements and using DHSs, dynamic hip screws or intramedullary nails. What else? Knees, loads of knee arthroscopy. So plenty of people with septic arthritis of the knee. So going in with your three ports and doing your massive washouts. What else? Few knee fractures actually. So tibial plateau fractures, I think I saw. And what else? Oh yeah, femur fractures too. That was interesting. And then also plenty of ankles loads of ankle fractures uh, from people rolling over you know on their ankle or falling from large heights or whatever it was and some spinal surgery i was involved in i think three spinal surgeries what are they called again t lifts yeah that was it transferaminal lumbar interbody fusion okay no wonder i didn't remember it <laughs> just remember this t lift anyway so yeah so a bunch of uh, spinal surgery in the survival spine in the lumbar spine and in the thoracic spine as well so wide wide range and then what else did we see achilles tendon i'm just reading off my notes here achilles tendon repairs hallux valgus deformities so this is deformity of the big toe in the foot a lot of joint injections so steroid joint injections yeah just every i mean the variety of things that you do in orthopedic surgery is just so, so, so good. i i loved it. it was truly amazing and like i'm a massive nerd when it comes to all of the the tools and devices that are used in surgery. I think it's incredibly, incredibly interesting. And I'm gonna be doing a master's in medical robotics and image guided intervention over the next year. And I'm so, so, so excited to learn about these things. I think, you know, the design of these tools and their ergonomics and the intuitiveness of how pieces fit together and you go from step one to step two to step three, almost by default in using the tool. It's so, so, so interesting. I'm a massive nerd when it comes to this stuff. So I'm really excited to, uh, to study it. Yeah, you know, I'd be in theater holding all these plates and screws and the instruments, the drills and everything, and just looking at them and thinking about how they work and who designed these. And anyway, I'll talk about that a lot more in a future video, but surgery was amazing is the bottom line here. And honestly, the best part about all of this was just the teaching. So, you know, before the, before we'd go into surgery, me and the registrar, we would review the relevant imaging that we had, whether that was an X-ray, an MRI, a CT scan, whatever. And then we would say, and then he would say, she would say, we're going to do this approach in order to fix this thing. And we would read up on the approach, talk through all the different steps. They would tell me, you know, what you'll expect to see in this step once we've done this, once we've done that. And then when we're scrumped up and in theater and actually doing it, you know, they would look and they'd be like, what is this? You know, what step are we at? What are you expecting to find once I dissect through this muscle? Blah, 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 blah. And so, you know, it was just really, really good enforcement and learning of what we had just talked about running through the case, actually doing the surgery, closing up, seeing the patient on the ward. Just what an amazing rotation, honestly, 10 out of 10. Now let's talk about the rota. 
Okay, so let's talk about the rota. So the rota is the schedule. And you know, if you've seen my previous videos, you'll know just how much the schedule changes between the different jobs that you rotate through. But I mentioned before in this video that when they moved me from palliative medicine to orthopedic surgery, they decided to keep me nine to five, not on the on-call rota. So no nights, no evenings, nothing on call in case I had to move back. And actually I didn't end up moving back for the entire rotation. So I stayed nine to five, Monday to Friday for the entire rotation. Now, in terms of having a good work-life balance, this was amazing. You know, working nine to five, Monday to Friday is something I've never done in all my time being a doctor and it was incredible. You know, usually we're working weekends, we're working nights, we're working in the evenings, unsociable hours, blah, blah, blah. So this was a huge, huge change. So. So that was the benefit of this rota. The thing that I missed or I lacked from this rota was the experience of being a um, surgical SHO on clinic. So what this means is that in the evenings and on nights and weekends, you cover multiple different surgical specialties. So in our hospital, you covered orthopedic surgery, urology, and general surgery. When I was an F1 at the Royal Free and Vascular Surgery last year, at night and on the weekends and on the evenings, I would cover vascular surgery, orthopedic surgery, urology, and general surgery. So. I had some experience doing this, but as an SHO, as an F2, you get a lot more responsibility, particularly in the place of referrals. So when you're an SHO, you take referrals for these specialties, which means other doctors call you from A&E saying, hey, I have a patient I want to admit under your specialty, and they refer that patient to you. So you gain a lot of experience in being able to take referrals. And this is something that I did not get experience in because I was not uh, on the on-call rota in orthopedic surgery. I would have loved to get that experience and it would have been very uh, useful and very valuable for me in my future surgical training. But at the same time, I will get that experience in due time. It's okay, I didn't need to get it now. And on the flip side, I got a very stable and secure schedule. I had a lot more free time in, in, my, in my life and I managed to have a good work-life balance. So from an intellectual point of view, I would have liked to gain all of that knowledge, but from a lifestyle point of view, it was very beneficial. So it's a toss up. The F1s were scheduled to work from eight to four. I very, very rarely saw them finish at four. They almost always finished at five, if not 5.30, sometimes six. And you know, I would always be there until they finished. I never left before they did. And it just sucked for them because they're, they're not getting paid for that time. They're supposed to be there from eight to four, but they still have loads of work to do until, you know, five. If all the F1s left at four, I would be there until like eight or nine finishing that work. So they would stay until about five and then hand over the remaining work. I would finish that to like 5.36 and then go home. So we would all stay late, usually by at least an hour, which was not very nice, but part of the BS of, of the job, unfortunately. Okay, all right, let's talk about patients and their emergencies in an orthopedic surgery perspective context. So there are a few orthopedic surgery emergencies. So one of them is compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome is when a compartment of the body, usually a compartment containing muscles, so enclosed in a fascia, becomes swollen or inflamed or increases in size for whatever reason, due to swelling or infection or inflammation, whatever, and becomes swollen, swollen, swollen within a contained space within that compartment. And this is something that needs urgent decompression. And if you identify it, it needs emergency surgery that needs to happen within, I think, 30 minutes or an hour. And this is done in a few different ways, but commonly you can do needle decompression, which is when you literally take a needle and stick it into that compartment, wherever that muscular compartment is, in the arm or in the thigh or wherever. Then you can do fasciotomy, which is, I won't put up a picture on screen, but you guys should Google that if you're into this kind of thing, but where you kind of cut a whole series of lines down to the level of the fascia to allow that swelling to kind of decompress and release on its own and nice and slowly. Other orthopedic emergencies, we have septic arthritis. So this is infection of a joint space. So this can be anywhere in the body, it can be in the hip, the knee, the shoulder, but most commonly it's gonna happen in the knee or in the hip, I think are the two most common ones. And this is an infection inside the joint space, which is very bad because it can lead to permanent non-reversible damage to the soft tissues in the joint within about eight hours or so of onset of infection. So that's another emergency that needs dealing with immediately. And this is done through a washout. So in the knee, for example, you take the knee, you place um, a few ports, and then you can go in with a camera and with effectively an, uh, it's a tube for irrigation and you just pump liters and liters and liters of saline solution into there to try and drain out any of the infected material, any of the bacteria, etc. You can also debride some of the soft tissues 
or some of the joint space if you can see that it's already dead or damaged or infected and so you need to clean out that joint so that's septic arthritis then coda equina coda equina is an emergency but this will be dealt with neurosurgery not with orthopedic surgery depending on where you are what hospital you're in etc in our hospital anyways it was dealt with by neurosurgery and these patients get referred uh, to neurosurgeons at a different hospital but some places with orthopedic surgery deal with that and then lastly fractures to bones that compromise the vascular supply to that bone so there's a few bones in the body where if you break them they are at very high risk of losing their blood supply and going into what we call avascular necrosis so avascular not vascularized not receiving blood flow necrosis necrotizing necrosing the death of the tissue basically so, so examples of this would be the scaphoid bone in the wrist the navicular bone in the foot and then you can also get this of course with intracapsular neck of femur fractures. I saw a lot of septic arthritis actually, mostly in the knee. I saw one navicular bone fracture in the foot. Um, I didn't see any compartment syndrome whilst I was in orthopedic surgery, but I did see a patient with compartment syndrome overnight actually when I was working in acute medicine in my rotation for orthopedic surgery. Yeah, I didn't see any cauda equina whilst in orthopedics, but whilst working in emergency medicine, I saw quite a few cauda equina cases. So yeah, so, and funnily enough with compartment syndrome, it's the one thing that you learn about in medical school over and over and over and over again, this gets drilled into your head. Compartment syndrome being this really big emergency that needs immediate orthopedic input. Okay, so conclusion time. Just gonna come right out and say this was a 10 out of 10 rotation for me the best rotation out of all of my jobs that i've done as a f1 and f2 doctor very 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 happy with it i honestly had such 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 a great time and it's helped confirm for me that orthopedic surgery is the specialty that i want to go into which is great news because now i know and i can just sit down and focus on that and yeah just the level of independence the support from the seniors the amazing team of doctors and other healthcare professionals that I was surrounded by during my time, just made for truly an amazing experience. I really, really loved it. And I'm so grateful that I got moved from pie medicine and was given the opportunity to do orthopedic surgery. Um, so touch wood, had an absolutely great time. And yeah, that's it for me. That's it for this video. Maybe in a few years from now, I'll make a video titled, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. So just give it a few years and <laughs> we'll get there eventually, I guess. But anyways, that's it for me. I'm gonna go to the gym so I could be an ortho bro in due time and i'll catch you in the next video thanks for watching peace peace